Good morning, church. It's good to see you here this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us, and we pray that God blesses you for being here. 
We get the privilege this morning of starting our service with one of the two ordinances of the church. We get to celebrate in baptism. And so with that, let's bow our heads in prayer and uh, then we'll continue. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We pray, Lord God, that you will be with us in this service. May your Holy Spirit touch each and every one of us here today. And as we witness this public profession of baptism, Father, we pray that you'll be with the participant. And Father, I pray that you'll be with him and give him strength. Father, I pray that you will always continuously and forever be with him. As he makes a statement before this congregation, we witness what he has said in his profession toward Christ. His name we do pray. Amen. David, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. What a great way to start a service. Let's stand and sing since Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been on since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for as long as it's not since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Let the joy of my soul and the sea be loose for me. Jesus came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is stuck as a shore since Jesus came into my heart. In the dark clouds of doubt, now my path looks good since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, there's a light in the valley of death above me. Since Jesus came into my heart, and the gates of the city I can see. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy are my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy, so I'm gonna go. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy are my soul, and the Y'all may be seated, and to give us our welcome, I'll let Michael do. Hey, uh, good morning. It is a good morning, whether you believe it or not. I like, I'm glad that everybody's here to Mill Creek. We welcome you. If you're here for the first time, we're glad that you're here and we want you to come back. That's the request. We're going to request that you come back and be 
a part of this wonderful church of Mill Creek. I just love Mill Creek to death. Hey, been here for about 20 something years, I think now. That's a long time. But some have been here for like 55 years. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thing too. But anyway, we welcome you here. And now I just ask you to bow your heads and you pray with me this morning. Oh, gracious heavenly father, we just want to say thanks. Thanks you each and every day, every morning before my feet or your feet hit the floor out of your bed or your recounter, you must give thanks to God because he gave you a good night's sleep. He got you up this morning, made you do some things, let you do some things. He brought you to his house. And that's, that is why we go to church. We go to church because we want to praise God. We want to give him our best each and every day because he does so much for us. Don't forget about his son now. But we love you. And if we just want to say thank you for everything that you do in our lives. We just have to let this day that you give us that we love one another. We thank you now, Father, for those things. Have a gratitude, not an attitude for the love that he shared for you. And we ask all these things, Father God, in your precious son's name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I have an announcement that I'll do later as well, but I just wanted to make this special announcement. In your bulletin, Miss Joy Ware is Miss Joy Bullware and will be 100 years old in two weeks. And so we... We want to send her as much love as possible for her birthday. So they are asking that we send birthday cards to her for the next two weeks um, just to celebrate her birthday with her. So her address is on that yellow piece of paper in your bulletin. So please write her a birthday card and send that to her so she can feel the love from this church. Let's stand and sing. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day that makes my joy so be my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He told me how to want to pray. No one is happy. <laughs> there is not smiles on your faces. If it's a happy day and Jesus has washed our sins away, there should be a smile on your face. So, all right, let's keep singing. Tis done the great transaction stuff. I am my Lord and he is mine. He drew me and I followed on. Rejoicing in the call divine. Happy day, happy day. Let me just wash my sins away. He told me to watch and pray. And live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away. Now rest my long, divided heart, fixed on this blissful center rest. Here have I found a noble part, here heavenly pleasures fill my breast. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away, he told me to what to pray. Wash my sins away. 
I have that hears the song of thy thou, thou renewed shall daily hear till it likes night and star I bow the blessed and the blessed oh dear happy day happy day when Jesus washed my sins away he took me to a I don't know about y'all, but when you're smiling, you sing louder. It's great. And so we are going to continue on with this joy and singing, He Lives. See, Ann, Ann said, smile, and she's got Michael up here smiling like crazy. But, you know, it, it looks good out there to see all these smiles. It's like, it's like the radiance of the sun, and you know how the sun makes you feel good? Those smiles make you feel good. Uh, and we love you, Mill Creek. Now, she mentioned Mrs. Uh, Joy. Well, now, I was talking to Miss Billy earlier. I see there's three ladies that we truly love. There's Miss Joy, there's Miss Penner. I got to see her yesterday. And we got the baby girl, Miss Billy. <laughs> <laughs> we love them all. Uh, go with me in prayer. <laughs> Lord, we come once again just giving you thanks for all that you do for us, Lord. We know, Father, that you touch us every day with that 
that grace and mercy. You give us that start, Father, to get up, especially today, to come in and give you all of the honor, the glory, and all the praise. Lord, we, 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 we know that without you, things can't be done. We can't do it on our own. And we just love that you sent your son to die for us, to, to ensure us a place in heaven so that we can rejoice with you to eternity. We love you, Father, and we just ask that you would go through us, go with us through these services, fill our hearts and minds with the understanding of your word. Uh, well, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's continue the joyful singing and stand and sing Heaven Came Down. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity to come to the house and worship and praise your name. We're going to thank you, the Lord, for all we've already done for it, for the bad privileges we've already had. But George, for now, as we go through our service, be with Pastor and bring us a message. Bless the name I ask it. Amen. <laughs>
Amen. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. If you remember, we started a series a while back on following God, and uh, then we had Easter and all the stuff that goes with that, and we've been uh, dealing with that. We're coming back. We started with the life of Abraham, and now we will get to skip a certain section there in Genesis and go to Jacob. Genesis chapter 25, we'll be reading verse 19 through verse 34. Have any of you ever heard of the term golden parachute before? Okay, a golden parachute. Well, usually if you jump out of a plane, you don't want a golden parachute. That that wouldn't help you. You may be a rich man, but not for long. But uh, the issue of a golden parachute is basically that which is coined for CEOs who uh, are in corporations who basically they could run, they could do great things or they could run the corporation into the ground and make it go into bankruptcy, but they have a golden parachute. Some of them get anywhere from a million dollars to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, 100 million dollars in the golden parachute so that they will um, be able to have something, I guess, to remember how they ran the company in the ground for. That's a great thing. But we have something better than a golden parachute. It doesn't just last for this world and perish. We have a golden parachute in Christ. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We start in verse 19. This is the generation or genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived, but the the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? And so she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, or uh, loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field and was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, "Please feed me with the same red stew, for I am weary." Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, "Sell me your birthright as of this day." And Esau said, "Look." I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew and lentils, and he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, oftentimes, we often think of the New Testament as the Testament of grace and Old Testament as the Old Testament of law, and that would be reasonable. However, to think that grace only came about in the Old Testament or in the New Testament would be a mistake as well. For instance, a passage that we skipped over, you can read it later, I'm not going to read it now, but it's in chapter 16 of Genesis. In fact, God is making his covenant with Abraham. He has began, and you'll notice if you read through Genesis, it's almost as if the covenant comes to Abraham in pieces. But he actually cut the covenant, and that is a real term. For instance, we get the term cut the contract. 
today. Let's cut a contract together. Well, it's very similar to cutting a covenant. But literally, back in the biblical days of Abraham, you literally did cut a covenant. And what I mean by that is if you read 16, God comes to Abraham and he tells them several animals to get, and he gets those animals, and Abraham cuts those animals right down the middle. And he cuts them and he separates them and creates a middle aisle, just like we have in the church here. And when he does that, uh, they are supposed to walk through uh, the people that are cutting the covenant with these animals. Now, if, for instance, Michael and I came together and we were doing it the old-fashioned way and we were going to cut a covenant, then we would, in fact, uh, make an agreement, get those animals, separate them, and you and I, Michael, would walk through the covenant together between those animals, cut a covenant. However, what if Michael is very rich and he's a great guy, a righteous man, and I'm very poor and I'm not a righteous man? I am known to be a scoundrel then we would not, number one, I would suggest that you not cut a covenant with me. And secondly, it would be what is called an uneven covenant. If someone from lower uh, status or uh, righteousness were to try to cut a covenant with a righteous man, it would be a covenant that should not be cut. So the question is this. If I cannot cut a covenant with Michael. I don't care how good of a man he is, how much money he has. The Bible said he is still what? A sinner, right? Even though he's a righteous man, he's still a sinner because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here's a better question. How in the world could Abraham, as good as he, good a man as he is, and we've already seen some of his faults, how could he cut a covenant with God? That's a better question. And of course, if you read that, you'll read that, and most people miss this, and they don't see it. But in fact, God puts Abraham to sleep after he cuts the covenant, and Abraham does not pass through. You say, ah, then it's not for real. No, 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 no. You'll notice what happens. Out of nowhere, a flight, a torch comes through, and that torch mystically goes through the covenant that was cut. You say, that's amazing. That's amazing because it is an early indicator of grace. What do you mean by that? I mean by that is a precursor to what happens on a cross thousands of years later. That's why Jesus is the Son of Man. What does that mean? He means he represents mankind. And he, in fact, cut a covenant on the cross with God the Father and we are the beneficiaries. Grace is what we're going to see in the life of Jacob. Jacob was not a perfect man. Abraham was not a perfect man. People get confused when they look at Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they say, wait a minute, look at all the things they did wrong. You better be glad that the Bible gives us those examples, because guess what? You and I also sin, and therefore God has cut a covenant with sinful humanity, and because of that, we're here today, we are saved, and we are promised all of eternity, all of God's people said. So we're going to see a dysfunctional family in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but in that dysfunction, we see ourselves. We see us, because we ourselves are dysfunctional. In other words, we just sometimes don't work. The word there in verse 19 that we just read, the first verse of our text today, in fact, in the Hebrew, is used in chapter 5, 6, 10, 11, and 25, the one you just see. And for you, for me, for instance, it is, saying, it is called the genealogy of Isaac. But in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word there is actually speaks to the account of Isaac. There's something I want you to know today. I want you to know that when you come and make covenant with God, when you are saved, when you come and ask Jesus Christ into your life, there is an account for you in heaven. There is an account for you in heaven. And in fact, it is counted as righteousness. It is not like the golden parachute of the world that you take, and it doesn't matter what size it is. It doesn't matter if they give you a $100 million golden parachute. It doesn't matter if they give you a billion-dollar golden parachute. 
Guess what? The moment you stop breathing on planet Earth, you're dead. And you cannot take it with you. You could bury it in your casket. You could put stocks and bonds and gold and all that other stuff and bury it with you. But guess what? You can't spend it. But the one thing that you can have that goes beyond this world is the golden parachute, the account that God lays up for his people. I want to talk to you this morning about how a sovereign God calls a family. We see it in an unexpected announcement in verse 19 to verse 22. In fact, uh, she is concerned, that is, Rebecca, of what's going on inside. She can feel what it's like to have a fight between twins inside of her body. Maybe the ladies can imagine that to some extent. And so when we see that, all of a sudden Isaac is concerned too. And Isaac, being a man of God, knows that he can go to God and God can hear him and he will respond to him. Have any of you ever gone to God and spoken to God and know that God is listening? That's what Isaac did. How does this happen? He prays a powerful prayer in verse 21. Notice what it says. It says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. In other words, he had intercessory prayer. Have you ever prayed for another person? That's intercessory prayer. And you have to believe, my friend, you have to believe that prayer goes beyond the ceiling of the place you're praying. In fact, what often happens is we in our fast world, we think that everything is like a 30-minute sitcom right? Everything can fall apart in the first minute of a situation comedy. And by the time you get to the end, everything is fixed. Just 30 minutes before, uh, those two girls hated each other, but now they're hugging and they're making up and they're friends again. Everything can fall apart. The world can fall apart. Even if you go to a movie in two hours, at one minute, all of a sudden, a nuclear war is about to happen. And within a couple hours, nuclear war is averted. And we think prayer is like that. Prayer is not like that. In fact, we see it. Prayer works on God's timetable. He is the one in control, not you, not me. We see in verse 20, in fact, Isaac goes and he's 40 years old when he is married to Rebecca. But in verse 26, isn't it amazing? We think the Bible is just like any other book. No, in six verses, he goes from age 40 to age 60. 20 years have passed. Think about what's happened. In two decades, he prayed tw uh, 20 years before, and all of a sudden now she becomes pregnant. How easy would it have been for Isaac to say, golly, after a year, don't you think God would have answered? What about a decade? That 10 years, isn't that enough? How about two decades? I've got better examples than that. In fact, when Israel eventually goes down to the prom or goes down to Egypt, and they're enslaved, they begin immediately as they are enslaved praying that God would deliver them. Let's see, how long did it take God to send a deliverer named Moses? How's this? 400 years. 400 years. How many people died? How many generations came about before, in fact, God sent Moses? Israel prayed for a Messiah. From the time of David, they're praying for the Messiah because David speaks and he says, from his lineage, the Messiah will come. Let me see. When was David king of Israel? Oh, a thousand years before Jesus showed up. Prayer works on God's timetable. You say, I don't like that. I don't like it either. You act like I like it. I don't like it. I'm just a messenger. You know, some people think that they can treat God just like they treat anything else in this world. Imagine if somebody got mad at the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe they went to the Atlantic Ocean and they lost some um, special jewelry or something like that, and they got mad at the Atlantic Ocean. You say, that's ridiculous. I know, I'm just trying to make a point. And they get mad at the Atlantic Ocean, and they come up to you, Brother Michael, and they said, you know what, Michael, I'm mad at the Atlantic Ocean. You think, well, that's strange. But... They said, in fact, I don't even believe in the Atlantic Ocean anymore. Is the Atlantic Ocean still there? 
That's what they think they can do to God. <laughs> he said, oh, okay, I'm mad. I don't believe anymore. Really? Do you think that makes God not be? And so often what we think is that we can play the game with God just like we played with our parents or, or somebody else, and we can simply just put our lip out and just fold our arms and we're going to... That does nothing to God. It only hurts us. It only hurts me and you. Two nations, she said, or God said, are in your room. In verse 23, this is the will of God, which is in Christ Jesus that we say in the New Testament. It reflects, however, the idea of blessing and chosenness in the Old Testament. They had no problem with a lot of these things because in those days they understood God brings the rain, and that's just the way it is. God brings drought, and that's just the way it is. You can deal with it or not. But immediately, Isaac understands that if I go to the Lord in prayer, God will hear me. I knew a missionary many years ago. She could not conceive and have children. She wanted children more than anything. She came from a large family, and she wanted to have a large family herself. What did she did not realize is that she could not have children. After several years, she admitted herself she was bitter about it, but she just went to the Lord and prayed and asked God to heal her heart. And as he healed her heart, in fact, she realized that that was a great ministry. And whenever she would go overseas and she would uh, do her work, her and her husband, her husband did her, his part, and one of her ministries was to find in the local village or town or city that they were in, find every woman who was barren and could not conceive children. And she put them at the pinnacle of her ministry. She would be with them for the rest of her life, and she would make sure that they knew they were loved. She took a difficult situation and turned it into a victory. Now, that's what we understand, that sometimes God is going to say to us, I know what you want, but I'm not going to give it. And that's what she did with that. She served the rest of her life, at least since I've known her, and she never had children, but she took a bad thing and turned it into a wonderful thing. Let me tell you another story. I've told part of this before. You know, my brother, younger brother Jeff, who lives in Louisville, he comes and every once in a while they'll come down, especially at Christmas time, and, and worship with us and different things like that. He got married a little later on in life, and they wanted to have children as soon as possible, and they tried to have children, and they couldn't have children. They tried, and they tried, and they tried. Nothing happened. And all of a sudden, they said, we're going to try everything we can, and I began to pray. I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And for, for long, eventually, she was pregnant. Jessica was pregnant. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, God answered that prayer. I said, Lord, I don't want to be presumptuous. But I said, they've tried for so long. I said, could they have twins? Two for one? <laughs> and sure enough, she said, when they did the ultrasound, had twins. <laughs> and then I said, Lord, again, I don't want to be presumptuous, but thinking of my mom, I said, she has two grandsons. I said, could the twins be one a boy and one a girl? Therefore, my mom could have a granddaughter as well. And sure enough, they have the twins, and one is a boy, and one is a girl. Now, I tell you that story because I wanted to give you both sides of the coin. I wanted to tell you and let you know that just because someone prays doesn't mean everything that they ask for is going to come true. But I am here to ask you to trust and believe in God. You never know what God is going to do. I've had many people in many churches. I've, I've pastored thousands of people of, over the three decades that I've done this, and, and many of them simply never have children, and they adopt, and they do a wonderful thing. They take a, a difficult situation and turn it into a beautiful situation. The key is this. Go to God in prayer. Trust and believe. Maybe he will give you exactly what you asked for, and maybe he will say, let me see what you do with the situation you're in. You have not, Jesus, or James says, because you ask not. 
After prayer is fulfilled, we see an undeniable difference between the two that are, that are born. We see them physically and personally. They are different. Their personalities are different, and they look different. So we see this all throughout the Scripture. Esau was a woodsman, and Jacob was more... When they read Jacob, everybody thinks that means Jacob was like uh, just stayed in the house and baked cookies all the time. That's really not what that means. If you read it in the Hebrew, really what it means is that Jacob was someone who was more like an administrator. He was someone who enjoyed being indoors. He was enjoy, someone who enjoyed thinking. He was probably uh, someone who was uh, introverted. He was somebody who enjoyed putting things together and making it happen. And in fact, uh, Esau was not that at all. Esau was someone who was very, liked being in the outdoors. And so you have two different kids growing up next to each other. But then a feud continues to occur. That which was going on inside of Rebecca continued on the outside. And by the way, watch the news lately. It's still going on today. It's still going on today. The descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau are still arguing today. I think about the game show called Family Feud. You ever seen Family Feud? You know what that was made off of? the creator of Family Feud was reading about the Hatfields and the McCoys. A little fight on the border of West Virginia and Kentucky. And what were they fighting over? A pig. That's what the Hatfields and McCoys began over. Somebody stole my pig. Let's kill each other. You say, why in the world would they do that? Why would, the, why would they do Why do people do anything? If you ever try to figure out people, stop. You'll never figure out people. So they had prayed. We see a difference between them. And the last thing we want to see is a statement. You have to care. If you want to understand this story that we just read, because as a kid, I didn't understand it. Because it looked like to me, Jacob and Esau both were troublemakers. But then I, as I got older and I began to understand how to study the Bible, I understand that's not the issue here. Because we're all troublemakers. You're a troublemaker and I'm a troublemaker. That's what it means when I start out saying what? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The issue here is not who is a troublemaker, who is a sinner. They're both sinners. They're all sinners. The only hero in the Bible that comes out clean is Jesus. Say amen. Esau, he said, I'm famished. What good is a birthright to me? In other words, Esau was a weak-minded, desperate and driven by his urges. Don't be that. Don't be weak-minded. Be strong-minded. Don't be desperate. Be in control. Don't be driven by your urges. Be driven by the Spirit of God. Someone said this. Here's a good word. Pursue wisdom, knowledge, right living, mercy, other weighty things that actually matter so that you won't foolishly set off, sell off your birthright and your blessing for what? A bowl of soup? Really? You see, that's the issue. It could breed despising characteristics within your life. In verse 33 and 34, we see this phrase, Esau despised his birthright. And isn't that amazing? That's how the story ends. That's the issue. He tells you what it is. He despised his birthright. And the word there in the Hebrew means to have contempt. In other words, he looked at his birthright with bitterness and discontentment. How in the world could you do such a thing? Esau hated the responsibility that came with it. I'm going to exit here a little bit. We'll come back to the passage. But here's the issue or one of the issues we see in Western civilization today. One of the issues we see in America today, we see way too many people who have lived in the greatest country in the history of the world. You realize that, right? Complaining about living in the greatest country in the history of the world. Are we crazy? I mean, Jacob and Esau, if they could get and they could come in that great time machine and come forward, they would see where you live, and they said, you're criticizing us? We live in the greatest country in the history of the world. Do you realize Julius Caesar 
would love to have some of the instruments you have in your house. They never saw a flat screen TV, never saw a phone that could call somebody halfway around the world, never saw something where you could send a picture or a live picture in a phone. Do you realize there is more technology in your phone than the first Apollo 13 landing? Do you realize how blessed you are? Live in God's blessing. I'm not just talking to anybody this morning. I'm talking to the church this morning. I'm talking to a bunch of saved folk this morning. I'm talking to a bunch of folk that when we started this sort of service, we started with the great blessing of a baptism this morning. We've had, so far, I think six baptisms this year. That doesn't count all the people who came forward, joined the church, did whatever. And yet we don't live in a wonderful blessing. Do you realize that if we don't have another baptism, hope we do, but if we don't have another baptism this year, we've done something that 90% of the churches in America will not do? <laughs> God is good all the time. We need to live in the blessing of the Lord and we will be grateful and we will be thank you, uh, thankful. What does all of this mean? One commentator said this. He said, all the people in this text were very unimpressive. <laughs> I would put it this way. I wouldn't say they were unimpressive. I would say they're just sinners like me and you. In fact, there's a story that Jesus tells that really encapsulates what's going on here. Here it is. There was a man one day who was walking through a field, and there he found a pearl the greatest pearl he had ever seen. It was a treasure like he could only dream of. He found that pearl, and he was wise, Brother Michael. He went and found the guy who owned that field. And he went and he said to him, he says, let me buy the field. I'm sure the farmer said, well, if you're asking, I'm going to hike up the price. He said, I'll pay it. Now, the farmer should have said, wow, maybe something's in that field I don't know about. But he didn't because he wasn't wise. He sold him that field and he went back to that field that he now owned and he pulled out that pearl and it was the greatest treasure in the history of the world. You know why it was the greatest treasure in the history of the world? Because Jesus basically was telling you about the kingdom of God. That's what you have. It doesn't matter what's in your bank account today. <laughs> it doesn't matter what's in your wallet doesn't matter how good looking you are, how tall you are, or what pretty hair you got. <laughs> you know what you have if you have Jesus? You have the greatest treasure in the history of the world. You see, that was the difference between Jacob and Esau. Esau did not realize what he had. That's the purpose of the story. Esau despised his birthright. He eventually would sell it all away and give it to Jacob. That's why in the prophecy, God told Rebekah, the older will serve the younger. There will be a greater nation and a less great nation, and they're all in your womb. And that is still true today. One nation is smaller in number, but great power. One has great number but not so great a power. You see, the issue is, and it all comes down to this, do you believe it? <laughs> because that's the difference. Jacob may not have been the best guy in the world, but he understood the value of the blessing. Now, I want you to leave this place and be good people. <laughs> that's not my point. I want you to go out here and be righteous men and women who help others and glorify God. But above all, Realize what you have. Don't be Esau. Don't despise what God has put in your heart. Understand that you, if you and I were to leave this world today, we would walk into a world that knows no pain. <laughs> We've got it. It's ours. Don't despise the blessing. Glorify God for it. Let's stand and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you this morning that we can come together and understand and know 
that we have the greatest treasure in the history of the world. We have the pearl of great price. We have the kingdom of God living inside of us. There is not a thing in this world that can be taken from us that is given from you. (laughs) And so, Lord, I pray that we will live in that blessing, that we will have an attitude of gratitude, that we will leave this place and we will realize there are millions of people on planet Earth who wish they had what we have. We have every reason to sing hymns this morning. We have every reason to pray. No matter what comes our way, Jesus is with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord Jesus, I love to be perfectly loved. I want thee forever to answer my soul. Return every idol, cast on every bow. Now wash me and I shall be to the snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. My feet for my cleansing, I see the rainbow. Now watch me, help me, shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, help me, show me water than snow. Lord Jesus, now knows I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou knewest the need. Now wash me, help me, show me water. dismissed and you have announcements for us i do don't forget to shower miss joy with birthday cards this week and next week um we are also having graduation recognition sunday on may the 19th so if you are graduating from high school college grad school whatever whatever, if you're graduating uh it's on the back page on the information that's needed um so get that to us by no later than may 5th and then Bean and Bailey is coming in two weeks. It's only two weeks away. So we need to tell the world, friends, family, neighbors, people at the store, anybody that will um, listen and, t- and, and come and join us. We want a great crowd. We're going to have lunch afterwards, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back. So if you want to be a part of that, um, we'd appreciate it. Um, we are having a simple lunch of sandwiches, chips, and dessert. So it's um, the meat and cheese are provided, but we would need um, everything else. And then um, our ladies' lunch and learn is this next Saturday at, on April 20th at 10 o'clock. We are doing purifying and storing water, and there is an activity to be done with that, so you don't want to miss it. And um, Operation Christmas Child for the month of April, we're collecting stuffed animals at four dollars cash. So that we can pay for the uh, boxes when we send them. And Bible study tonight, we're studying Revelation 17. We are moving our way through. Five o'clock. 
All right, very good. How many of y'all have friends? Uh, some of you are, yeah, okay. <laughs> Bring a friend with you on the 28th for being in Bailey. Uh, some of you remember, how many of you remember them coming before? Okay, so they they were purely a uh, Christian comedy uh, duo and also a singing duo at the time. Uh, now they do revivals, they'll still be funny and they'll still uh, sing and lead us in worship and stuff like that that Sunday morning but uh, they'll also be preaching the service that day. So make sure you bring a friend, and uh, we'll have a good time that morning, and then afterwards we'll go down and we'll have a wonderful time and fellowship and food together. So Fair. remember that. Bring your friends. We're doing a love offering for them as well that day. Yeah. So just remember that, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, how many of you noticed it was on, it's gone now, but it was on the screen? It says, uh, we're shutting down. Please wait. It said that up there. How many of y'all saw it? Yeah, up you, there you go. Some of you are paying attention. All right, we are getting ready to shut down. Uh, please wait. We're going to pray first. So I thought that was funny. <laughs> so, Brother Ben, will you lead us out in prayer? <laughs> 